Hello, you're watching Eye on Africa here on France 24. I'm Rochelle Harrison Pless. Good to have you with us. Coming up. Emergency workers in Kenya are in a desperate race against the clock, hoping to find survivors after a dam burst its banks. Fierce floodwaters wiping out entire villages and leaving at least 47 people dead. An organization helping abandoned mixed-race children in the Democratic Republic of Congo is hoping to reunite them with the foreign fathers they never knew and also asking the government to intervene. We have a special report from our team on the ground. Plus, Swad Abderrahim could soon make history after winning local elections in Tunis. The 53-year-old from the Islamist Ennahda party on track to become the Tunisian capital's first ever female mayor. First up, the scene has been described as hell on earth. Torrential rains caused a dam in western Kenya to burst its banks on Wednesday night, killing at least 47 people. The raging waters swept away entire villages, leaving more than 2,000 people homeless. Search and rescue teams in Solai, some 190 kilometres northwest of the capital Nairobi, are scrambling to find survivors buried in the mud. But there are fears the death toll could rise even further. I think it's fair to prepare the country that um, the magnitude of the tragedy uh, is um, huge. What happened is very, very tragic. Um, it's essentially an accident, uh, but we are engaged in investigations to, to, to find out, to establish what exactly happened. Earlier, I spoke to our Nairobi correspondent, Julia Steers, about the ongoing emergency operation. Local police chief said the death toll could still rise. As you just heard, there are still rescue workers and excavators on the scene. And victims were found several kilometers away from where the dam burst. So this was really a tremendously powerful rush of water that destroyed houses, buildings, power lines, and the local school. And reportedly, the six local hospitals are overwhelmed with the influx of victims. There were over 2,000 people affected, according to the local governor. And as the recovery process winds down in the next few days, the priority really will shift to finding a temporary shelter for these 2,000 people that have been displaced by the flood. Julia, weeks of torrential rains have led to flooding and mudslides across the country. It's been a, a very deadly rainy season. Yes, the county governor has said that there are safety engineers who are now being dispatched across Nakuru to assess the safety of several other dams in the area. Now, that's because there are a number of large reservoirs there because it is a uh, there are thousands of commercial farms in that area. As you mentioned, though, there are over 40 other counties in Kenya that have been afflicted by this heavy rainfall in the past few weeks, leading to up to 160 people who have been killed. And according to the U.N., 300,000 who have been displaced across Kenya. There has also been thousands of dollars worth of damage to roads and bridges here. So aside from this human and economic toll, the flooding recently has raised serious questions about the government's commitment to the infrastructure of the country. It has also really hampered the humanitarian response in terms of getting people able to access these counties that are suffering from the flooding. Now, at this point, health organizations are warning Kenyans to be vigilant about water sanitation as well. These flood conditions are particularly ripe for the spread of diseases like mosquito-borne illness and cholera. So at this point, NGOs are warning Kenyans that could be the next phase of this crisis. Well, Julia Steers with an update from Kenya there. Next, a brazen attack on a mosque on the outskirts of Durban has left at least one person dead. Three men armed with guns and knives entered the building after midday prayers on Thursday, attacking three worshippers by slitting their throats. The assailants then set fire to some of the rooms in the mosque before fleeing the scene. South African police are now investigating. Now, a formal apology to Libyan dissident Abdel Hakim Belhaj. The UK says it's profoundly sorry for its role in a so-called rendition operation, actions that led to his detention and torture 
by Muammar Gaddafi's forces in 2004. His wife, Fatima Bouchar, who was pregnant at the time, was also jailed. British Prime Minister Theresa May said the couple had suffered appalling treatment. As compensation, they'll receive a £500,000 payout. Let's hear from Mr Belhaj. I hope this move by the British will open a new page and serve as an example for the many governments that do not respect human rights. Four new suspected cases of Ebola have been reported in the Democratic Republic of Congo, just days after the country's health officials confirmed an outbreak of the deadly disease. The epidemic has struck near the northwestern town of Bikoro. Of the 25 people who reported Ebola symptoms over the last few months, at least 17 have died. Despite being thousands of kilometres away, authorities in Nigeria have reacted quickly to the news, putting in place a series of emergency measures such as increasing screenings at airports and other entry points across the country. Now to an emotional journey to find their fathers. An organisation for mixed-race children in the Democratic Republic of Congo is calling on the government to step in and help reunite them with the parents they never knew. Hundreds of these children were abandoned by foreign fathers, many of them from European countries, leaving the Congolese mothers alone and struggling to cope. This report from our correspondent Thomas Nicolon. Once a month, members of the Association for Mixed Race Congolese get together. They all share the same story, an unknown father from another country who disappeared when they were born. I met her dad once whilst going to the market, and as soon as I knew, I told him I was pregnant. I never heard from him ever again. I even went to his workplace, where I was told he'd returned to his home country in Japan. I asked for assistance for the child, but no one gave me anything, not even any food. The association has more than 300 members. It tries to raise awareness among Congolese women that relationships with foreigners only passing through the country come with particular emotional risks and can be traumatic for any unplanned children that result. Members are also calling on the government to help such children get in touch with absent fathers overseas. The Congolese government must work with us so that we can find the men who committed these crimes. Because abandoning children is a crime, no matter where you're from. If the government agrees to help us, I believe in the future people will think twice before abandoning a child. The government has also spoken out against foreigners abandoning their Congolese families and says that in DRC it is illegal for a man not to acknowledge his own child. These foreigners who have children with Congolese women must take responsibility for their acts. Otherwise, they can be sued wherever they live so that they can fix the problems they've caused by abandoning a child with a mother who's often poor, a mother who can't provide for the child. Western embassies held this initiative from the association, but they say they can't do much to fix an issue that's existed in Congo since colonial times. Meanwhile, many of these Congolese children of mixed heritage continue to struggle with mixed feelings about their faraway fathers. And we finish in Tunisia, where the Islamist Ennahda party has failed to clinch an outright majority in the country's local elections. Ennahda came out on top in several big cities, including the capital, defeating its coalition partner, the Nida Tunes party, by more than 500 seats. But independents beat both parties, taking nearly a third of the total vote. Sunday's poll was the first since the 2011 revolution, but was overshadowed by low voter turnout. Meanwhile, in the capital, Tunis, Inada candidate Swad Abderrahim is on the brink of making history. The 53-year-old pharmacist turned politician could become the city's first ever female mayor. Radaba Abbas reports. A businesswoman, a pharmacist and a former MP, Swad Abdul Rahim is a seasoned candidate of the Inada party. 
She's tipped to become the first female mayor of Tunis, marking a major milestone in the country's history. The Tunisian people gave me their trust. We have 21 seats out of 60 for the Tunis municipality. It's a great responsibility from the voters. Now that there are dealings and discussions, I might be elected mayor of Tunis. Between 2011 and 2014, Abdul Rahim earned a reputation for defending the Islamic ideals of the Inada party at the National Constituent Assembly. But when she joined the campaign in September last year, she rejected the label of Islamic candidate, instead choosing to define herself as an independent. Independence means to be out of the organization. My ideas are liberal and reformative. In 2011, she was criticized by human rights campaigners for targeting single mothers and calling them a disgrace to Tunisian society. I apologize to all of the women of my country and to women all over the world because the interpretation of what I said shocked and hurt not just me, but a lot of women. Sunday's poll was the first local free municipal election since the revolution in 2011, which triggered the Arab Spring. Despite this, the voter turnout was recorded at just 33 percent. Abdul Rahim has stressed the need for devolution to restore confidence among citizens. Stay with us. More news coming up. What do you want from your news website? Fosvancat.com, giving you easier access to information and faster for a unique experience. Fosvancat.com, the international news website.